Chapter Twenty Three of Moral Letters, Volume One by Seneca, translated by Gamir. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Twenty Three, on the true joy which comes from philosophy. Do you suppose that I shall write you how kindly the winter season has dealt with us? A short season and a mild one. Or what a nasty spring we are having? Cold weather, out of season. And all the other trivialities which people write when they are at a loss for topics of conversation? No, I shall communicate something which may help both you and myself. And what shall this something be? if not an exhortation to soundness of mind. Do you ask what is the foundation of a sound mind? It is not to find joy in useless things. I said that it was the foundation. It is really the pinnacle. We have reached the heights if we know what it is that we find joy in, and if we have not placed our happiness in the control of externals the man who is goaded ahead by hope of anything though it be within reach though it be easy of access and though his ambitions have never played him false is troubled and unsure of himself above all my dear lucilius make this your business learn how to feel joy do you think that I am now robbing you of many pleasures when I try to do away with the gifts of chance, when I counsel the avoidance of hope, the sweetest thing that gladdens our hearts? Quite the contrary. I do not wish you ever to be deprived of gladness. I would have it born inside your house. And it is born there, if only it be inside of you. Other objects of cheer do not fill a man's bosom. They merely smooth his brow and are inconstant, unless perhaps you believe that he who laughs has joy. The very soul must be happy and confident, lifted above every circumstance. Real joy, believe me, is a stern matter. Can one, do you think, despise death with a carefree countenance or with a blithe and gay expression as our young dandies are accustomed to say or can one thus open his door to poverty or hold the curb on his pleasures or contemplate the endurance of pain he who ponders these things in his heart is indeed full of joy but it is not a cheerful joy it is just this joy however of which i would have you become the owner for it will never fail you when once you have found its source. The yield of poor minds is on the surface. Those are really rich whose veins lurk deep, and they will make more bountiful returns to him who delves unceasingly. So, too, those baubles which delight the common crowd afford but a thin pleasure laid on as a coating and every joy that is only plated lacks a real basis but the joy of which i speak that to which i am endeavouring to lead you is something solid disclosing itself the more fully as you penetrate into it therefore i pray you my dearest lucilius do the one thing that can render you really happy cast aside and trample under foot all those things that glitter outwardly and are held out to you by another, or as obtainable from another. Footnote. By the various sects which profess to teach how happiness is to be obtained. And footnote. Look toward the true good, and rejoice only in that which comes from your own store. And what do I mean by from your own store? I mean from your very self, that which is the best part of you the frail body also even though we can accomplish nothing without it is to be regarded as necessary rather than as important it involves us in vain pleasures short-lived and soon to be regretted which unless they are reined in by extreme self-control will be transformed into the opposite this is what i mean pleasure unless it has been kept within bounds 
tends to rush headlong into the abyss of sorrow. But it is hard to keep within bounds in that which you believe to be good. The real good may be coveted with safety. Do you ask me what this real good is, and whence it derives? I will tell you. It comes from a good conscience, from honorable pursuits, from right actions, from contempt of the gifts of chance, from an even and calm way of living which treads but one path. For men who leap from one purpose to another, or do not even leap, but are carried over by a sort of hazard, how can such wavering and unstable persons possess any good that is fixed and lasting? There are only a few who control themselves and their affairs by a guiding purpose. The rest do not proceed. They are merely swept along, like objects afloat in a river. And of these objects, some are held back by sluggish waters and are transported gently. Others are torn along by a more violent current. Some, which are nearest the bank, are left there as the current slackens and others are carried out to sea by the onrush of the stream. Therefore, we should decide what we wish, and abide by the decision. Now is the time for me to pay my debt. I can give you a saying of your friend Epicurus, and thus clear this letter of its obligation. Quote, it is bothersome always to be beginning life. End quote or another which will perhaps express the meaning better quote, they live ill who are always beginning to live End quote. you are right in asking why the saying certainly stands in need of a commentary it is because the life of such persons is always incomplete but a man cannot stand prepared for the approach of death if he has just begun to live we must make it our aim already to have lived long enough. No one deems that he has done so if he is just on the point of planning his life. You need not think that there are few of this kind. Practically everyone is of such a stamp. Some men, indeed, only begin to live when it is time for them to leave off living. And if this seems surprising to you, I shall add that which will surprise you still more. Some men have left off living before they have begun. Farewell. End of chapter 23